Hi, I am the Reverend Beth Fain. I am one of the missioners for Congregational Vitality on the Mission Amplification Team. And my specialty area is working with existing congregations, helping existing congregations be everything they can be. And I'm here with my fabulous partner today. Ellie. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, do social media and multimedia for the Diocese of Texas. Um, so I've been helping out a lot with coordinating technology and learning with churches how to do all this stuff suddenly this year online. Um, so I'll be helping out with tech um, and I'll be interacting with y'all in the comments. So if you guys have any comments or questions, then I will politely interrupt Beth um, to get those questions answered for you. Thank you, Ellie. And uh, Ellie, just giving her a shout out, next, when, next Tuesday, there's another Lunch and Learn that Ellie and Stephanie Towns are going to be hosting on digital evangelism. Is that correct? Yep. Digital welcome and evangelism. Super. So, so here we go. Money stewardship. Words that um, I think put uh, fear and trembling in some people's hearts, especially this year in the midst of the pandemic. So we've created a little four week short series on some of the basics of money stewardship. And this first one is about creating a plan. And so we're gonna start with a prayer. This prayer was written particularly for the Diocese of Texas. Some of you who are Book of Common Prayer nerds recognize part of it for the Book of Common Prayer but we adapted it to be a prayer that we could pray for stewardship. So the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Generous and loving God, so draw our hearts to you, so guide our minds, so fill our imaginations, so control our wills that we may be wholly yours utterly dedicated to your service. Use us and all of our resources, each minute of our day, each of our humble gifts and talents, and even our finances, as you will. And always for your glory and for the welfare of your people, in and through and with the power of your spirit. Amen. So we're going to be talking specifically about one part of stewardship, which is money. And we know that one of the best ways that adults learn isn't by just someone talking to them. So we're giving you some information, but what we want you to know is that we have another platform that you are invited to consider being part of. A group of us are going to be using a curriculum created by a group called Sanctified Art and it's called our money story. And we're gonna be gathering every couple of weeks by Zoom for about an hour to encourage each other, to talk about what's working, what's not working, and to teach one another. I'm gonna post this again, but if you might be curious for more in-depth kind of conversation, email me at bfame at eppercenter.org. And we'll uh, have some more conversation about ways that we can support you besides these four uh, short, little teachings of best practices for money stewardship. Which leads me to one of my favorite slides, which is questions. We know that we are all having all kinds of new ways of thinking about all sorts of things, but particularly money stewardship and budgeting and financing. Your Mission AMP team wants to offer whatever will help you, and we need you to tell us. So if there is something that's like, oh, this is good, but if I had this, it would be better. We're here to provide and to, to serve alongside you, to partner with you. So email me or any of the Mission Amplification team, particularly Ken and Sailors. We'd love to create with you. Now, on to today's topic. So the first three things that we learn when we're born is to say, thank you, please, and share. Now, the truth is we all do pretty good with thank you. We all do pretty good with please, but if you've ever been around children, the share part is the challenge. But thank you, 
please, and share are at the heart of any money stewardship communication strategy. And as we go through about how we would make a plan, this is all gonna be based on some pretty significant research that was done by the National Study of Congregations Economic Practices. This is a nonprofit that between 2014 and 2017 did deep interviews on giving with 1,200 congregations in the United States across denominations. And they came up with some pretty significant things about what really makes good money stewardship missions. There's other kinds of stewardship. We're only talking about money today. And so they came across with what is most essential. I don't know about you, but I have to pick and choose what's most important. And when we're planning our money stewardship, there's some things we do that maybe really don't make a big difference that we just keep doing. And so as we go through the making a plan, we're gonna talk about what is most essential. So the first, your team. It doesn't have to be a big team. Usually a team of three can do it well, but how do you choose who's on your team? And this may be one of the most important pieces. We often think about looking at diversity and the truth is in a lot of our Episcopal churches, as far as race or age, cultural background, we're not that diverse. But when we're talking about money stewardship, it's a different kind of diversity. So here's one of the best, best practices brought out by research, which is really scary for some congregations. One of the most statistically important things can, that churches that have increased giving do is the rector, the vicar knows who pledges and how much. I know that's really scary for a lot of congregations. It feels like an overarching of a privacy issue, but the truth is we talk about a lot of things in congregations. And money is not any more different than, can I cook? Can I, um, can I sew? Can I do those things? And so in choosing our team, if we really wanna look at diversity in a very controlled and careful and private setting, we can look at who gives, who's pledging, who's pledged for a million years and, and gives a pretty good amount. They may or may not be the best person to be on our team. But maybe the person that gives $142.33 every month, that might be a really important person because they may be tithing. Or the person who pledged for the very first time last year, I'd want them on the team because they may have a whole new voice. Maybe the person that always gives $150 a month, always, that's another good person because maybe with some more education, they might increase their pledge. So looking at diversity, looking at in diversity of those people who pledge. Second, creating a timeline. Now, most of us do our money stewardship September, October, November, because it's tied in with funding our budget. Here's another important piece of research. The least effective money stewardship missions have to do with funding a budget. Stewardship is about discipleship, about offering our lives. Funding budgets are important, but tying how much we ask people to give to how much we need in our budget, statistically, is one of the worst things we can do. To figure out how to plan, to plan a budget, look at what people gave last year. That's probably the best way to get the information. But to separate the, the funding a budget from your money stewardship means you could do it in January. It doesn't have to be right now. January is actually not a bad time if you've been able to separate it from, are we gonna have enough money to fund the budget? Because people are starting the year, they're beginning new. This is a great time to teach about it. So maybe this isn't the year to change the timeline, but consider the timeline and the story we're telling with the timeline. Third, talk, teach, preach about money, money, money. And we're not saying give, give, give. The more the churches talked openly about money, the higher the percentage there was of their giving, according to the research. 
And it was, what does money mean to you? Do you need some help getting out of debt? How do you pick and choose your finances? We gave $500 to this mission and 35 people were, uh, were dead. Talking openly about money, if not every week, once a month, significantly in, increases the impact of those who give. And the place that nonprofits just are so enamored with churches, we are the only place that every week in our worship gets an opportunity to ask people to give. Money stop, money uh, nonprofits would say, we wish we had a way to ask people to give every week. So how are you doing your offertory in your live worship, not to say also your, um, especially your live feeds, your online worship? How are you talking about that? And we can talk about that. But every week we have an opportunity to say something about money and to invite people to give. Which leads me to one way that we can talk about money. And the Book of Common Prayer is a whole page of offertory sentences. Sometimes clergy are the only ones that know about it. There's one that says, let us with gladness present the offerings and oblations of our life and labor to the Lord. Of the 10 offertory sentences, that's the only one that is not a scripture. The first one is, offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Make good your vows to the Most High. And then there are eight more scriptures. What if every month one of the teachings was another one of those offertory sentences? And what did they say about stewardship in general, not just money stewardship? It's a very rich Bible study, and it's right in the prayer book. We don't have to create anything. It's already there storytelling. We're going to have a whole session on storytelling. Statistically, again, this is one of the most important things we can do. And now that we have access to the internet in a whole new way, thank you pandemic, we have some really amazing ways to do storytelling. But having people, having opportunities to, for individuals to tell stories about how their church is making a difference in their lives, in their world, this is a huge opportunity about some creative ways that we can do storytelling. And then finally, the mo one of the most statistically important things we can do is say thank you. Now, the thank you comes in different ways. Most of us will write a letter after our money stewardship form letter, thank you, Joe Smith, for pledging $1 million a week to St. Mary's Belfast. That's just to acknowledge someone's um, pledge. But thanking someone who gives for the first time is hugely significant for on, like, ongoing giving. And thanking a first time pledger is even more statistically significant for ongoing giving and increasing in giving. And finally, thanking everyone who gives beyond the form letter but with a handwritten note that's attractive, that lets them know not only we're so thankful that you pledged to our congregation, but because of you, how that money is going to make a difference. Saying thank you is something that makes a difference between churches who thrive financially in their money stewardship and those who don't. So for this little short session in making a plan, look at your team. How do you find real diversity on your team that maybe looks at giving patterns, financial giving patterns and choosing a diversity of people on your team? Creating a timeline. What's gonna work best in your congregation, particularly if it's no longer tied to the budget? What's going to make a difference? Talk openly, preach about it, teach about, about money, not just in giving to the congregation, but in ways that money is important to our lives. There's so many opportunities now within the midst of the pandemic. How could we have some conversations that begin to take away the transparency of money or make money transparent? Even now, beginning to think of people who have stories to tell that could really impact the discipleship of stewardship in your congregation. And finally, how many ways 
can you say thank you? Thank you, thank you, thank you. So has anything popped up, Ellie, before I show the last two slides? Um, I haven't seen any questions yet, but this is an invitation to anybody who has questions or comments. Um, go ahead and put them in the comments below and I'll graciously interrupt Beth um, to get those asked for you. I'm very curious and we're curious about things that you might be afraid about or anxious are uncertain about the part that might give you pause, like that doesn't make sense, or you talk too fast, or, or something that I'm wondering if Ellie, because she's uh, one of our, also our younger givers, what resonates with her too, where she would say, hmm, what's that about? If no one pops in with a question. Um, Jacob Bree said, it's really helpful. I've never had someone respond negatively to direct thank yous. I think that's so true. <laughs> I mean, why would you not want a thank you? Um, a really good go-to. And it, it is physically difficult to write out all those cards. It, I think it's worth it. Um, one thing that popped out to me um, personally is talking about money. Um, in church because I, I think that a lot of people are kind of at a loss for what is appropriate and maybe it's because in family settings we all have different ideas of what level of money talk is good um, and whether that's like society-wide money talk or our personal finances or this organization um, but do you have any advice for mm. navigating those topics and, and choosing a subject to bring up well, the first thing that the research said was that the, interestingly, the people that are most in a church often that are the most uncomfortable talking about money are actually the clergy. And that often clergy themselves have some real issues with money. And then as a part of that is the reason starting with what does money mean to you? How does it impact your life? Really starting really basic helps us get away with some of our fear about money. I think also another way is talking about one of the things that um, came out of the research that one of the most effective things that we can do with money stewardship is, is giving um, people some really helpful uh, programs or processes for how they make budgets, how they plan their own money, how they get out of debt. One of the things that was suggested is particularly with young families. Um, maybe no one ever bothered to talk to them about budgeting their money well, maybe older families too. And so really having the church as money as part of a gift from God talking about, well, how do we use our money? What is our, how we use our money? Tell the story of who we are and to not be afraid about talking about that as a part of Christians should probably spend their money different than someone else. <laughs> and so how does a Christian decide how to spend their money? And so you can start on a really personal level. Does that, does that what you were asking, Ellie? Oh yeah, definitely. I think that's really helpful. Um, and I would also say that as someone who is young and very young for the Episcopal Church, <laughs> um, I really appreciate it when people are able to talk bravely about these things because the question of money and economy and jobs is such a heavy stressor for so many Gen Z millennial and up, right? It, we all face it. But um, when the church can talk bravely about these things, it's mm. an evangelism tool as well. Um, I'm definitely drawn to brave spaces like that personally. I think a lot of other people are too. Well, and, and part of being transparent and part of being vulnerable. Um, money is a really vulnerable subject. And so as we have those, those conversations, as Christians, we learn to trust by trusting each other in that in that safe community. Yeah. For that alley. Uh, Rob says, um, talking about money with my congregation makes me nervous. Most <laughs> of them have been hurt by the church and are yes. not very trusting at church. Yeah, yeah. 
One of the things I think is easier in um, congregations that are beginning, Jacob Rees, um, speaking of Jacob at Holy Family Texas, does a really good job of, of talking about money um, in the midst of his offertory, but they're a new church. And so they've started with that culture. I think sometimes with existing congregations, it's harder because there is a lot of garbage. Um, that's why when we thinking about what we're really uh, communicating when we talk about money. And I would start with low hanging fruit. I would start with easier topics and I would even name it. I know some of you have really been hurt by churches and money. Here's our story. And so acknowledging the fear, um, one of the first sermons that I ever gave on money because the congregation was so uncomfortable with money um, was that every time in this sermon, when I talked about money, I just held up a dollar bill and it was funny instead of saying the word money. And so it was, so making, using humor is helpful, but I think also starting gently and easy, easily and acknowledging um, people's discomfort, acknowledging our own discomfort with that. And maybe in through some of the process of the storytelling we're going to talk about in two sessions is another way that we could also provide some pastoral support with that. Does that help? I think that that's, I hope that's helpful. Rob, is it helpful? Let us know in the comments. Um, and then Jacob said again, I find that a uniquely current challenge is helping people with a ton of student loan debt find a way to give generously in a planned way. <sighs> Amen. Well, and, and what is generously? Um, I think one of the things if we're talking openly about people's finances is looking at all of, all of the things that really are non-negotiable in our finances. If we're having those kind of conversations in our churches, when I talked about the, the woman that pledged $142.30 a month or whatever it was, that was a really generous gift. And so I think for me, Generosity is between you and God. Um, I am a single woman. I have saved my money. I really should be giving, I can give, I shouldn't be, I couldn't give more. Knowing that my son and his daughter who are starting, a, uh, and his wife who are starting a family, when they look at their total amount of money, their generous gift is significantly more than mine. So I mean, talking, I think also, do you think, um, Define generous. Uh, it's different for me than it probably is for Ellie than it is for someone who's on welfare. One of the things that struck me the most several years ago was the stewardship at Lord of the money stewardship at Lord of the Streets, which is a church for the folks who live on the street. And that community, which had had pledged generously, they had pledged seven hundred dollars a year. That was a generous gift. So I think acknowledging generosity is between you and God. Amen. That, that I think is a really important message to share with so many people. Um, yeah, generosity is not a specific number, says Jacob. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat. Um, so if somebody jumps in with one, there's a little bit of lag time. Um, so I might interrupt again, but I think uh, for now, we should talk about what you have planned and um, yep. invite people to more things. Yes. So here's what we're gonna talk about next week. Um, the money stewardship letter. Um, there's some pretty good information about how we reach out to people and begin to communicate what's going on. We have a team, we have a plan. And it was a typical practice for a year that there would be this letter that was signed by the senior warden and the rector that was this long letter inviting people to give. There's a better way. But I do think that in the midst of the pandemic, that mail has taken on a power that it didn't have a year ago. So we're going to talk about strategic things that indicate a good letter. 
and how we can do that and be creative. And what I'd love to do is any of you who are here, um, if you have some things that you did that actually were helpful to bring those because it would be a good thing to share that. And um, because the best way, I only know a few things. Together we all know lots of things. Which leads me to the final invitation is again. There are people that know a lot more than I do and they're all out there working on stewardship in their congregations. So if you would like to join some of us who are gonna be gathering to talk about how we are going to be navigating money stewardship. Also, if you'd like to look at the online curric curriculum, Sanctified Story, from Sanctified Story, our money, Sanctified Art, our money story, I invite you to do that. It's pretty creative. It's been um, modified for using communities that are worshiping remotely and uses a lot of different kinds of techniques to do that, but it's really about how do we talk about money. Um, you pay, but you pay according to the size of your congregation. It's a very modest price. And so that would be something, but we can, we can gather any way that would be helpful for you. We have a huge team of people who know lots of stuff. And so if you have something we haven't offered that would be helpful, if you'd like to be part of people having conversations, please email me at bfane at epicenter.org. And uh, we're here to serve you and walk this slide you, particularly right now, when I think there is more anxiety about money. Uh, there are people in our congregations that have less money than they had a year ago. There are people in our congregations that are afraid they're going to have less money in six months. There are people that are okay. So how do we talk about money in the midst of maybe one of the most anxious times I can ever remember. And how do we talk about it that builds discipleship? How do we talk about it that builds relationship with God? And most importantly, teaches us how to share, which may be one of the most important Christian words there are. So thank you for joining us. Anything else today, Ellie? Um, no, I think thank you guys so much. And we'll see you guys next week. Um, we'll be on Facebook Live at 1230. Um, just like this next Thursday, looking forward to seeing you guys. Um, and I'm really excited to see where this goes. We have three more iterations of this. And this one has been really fun. So and hopefully many more based on the things you want to do. This is our starting point. It's not our ending. Oh, yeah. If you guys have a topic that you want us to cover, um, we're around um, and there are plenty more lunch and learns to be had. So let In us my know. home office. Yeah. <laughs> it's perfect. So let's pray. And now God, where your truth has been spoken, may it grow in our hearts and inform our lives. Any place we've been amiss, we pray that you would gently correct us. Help us be more comfortable with money. And be with those, especially who are afraid or uncertain in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thanks, Allie. Thanks, friends. <laughs>